We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you guys. So, you know, I have to say, at the second service, you guys are really awake. Obviously, you've been caffeinated. It's a wonderful thing. Um, If you're joining us in person or online, special welcome to you guys. Um, Again, today we are talking about worlds apart. And we're going to be talking about this this subject of postmodernism. And it's something that you may be familiar with, you may have heard of, or maybe you haven't heard it but you've seen it and you don't even know it. But we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit of what some of the good things are about postmodernism, what postmodernism is specifically, some of the lies associated with postmodernism. And finally, we're going to be looking into God's Word to see what does God have to say about this thing that proliferates throughout our culture, okay? Um, I have to say this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. It's something that I've studied out in the past and had to study up more for this because, man, so much has happened over the last 10, 15 years and such, uh, and we're going to be talking about some of that. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for the truth that is in your word. You are truth. Father, we ask that you would help us to anchor our souls with your truth, with the truth. Father, we ask that you would speak to us and that you would speak through your people. I ask that you would speak through me, that you would help me to be bold and unapologetic about your word. And Father, I ask, I ask that you would fill us with your amazing grace and I thank you for it because I need it just as much today as the first day that I came to know about it. We pray this in Jesus' name and everyone said... Amen, amen, amen. Well, you know, when we talk about postmodernism, this is a philosophy, and something that you have to understand is the philosophy in the university or academics today, it's the worldview of society tomorrow, okay? So this has been something that's been talked about in academic worlds for a while, and you've seen some of this, especially in pop culture uh, over the last couple decades and before, and you may or may not have known it. You've seen it in things like, for instance, you remember when you're listening to the music, and you had those songs that you loved back in the day, and then suddenly you hear somebody covering it, and they're, they're updating the music. They're kind of putting a fresh spin on it. That's postmodernism. It's, it has the ability to look at something with fresh eyes. So it's not all that bad. In fact, some of the places that we've seen this, again, in pop culture, you've seen it at the movies. Maybe you didn't know what to call it, but again, uh, it was postmodernism. When, when you saw this week or this uh, summer, you went and you watched Maverick. Really, it would have been Top Gun 2 back in the 80s, but now it's just Maverick. It was an update. Or maybe you watched Ghostbusters back in the day, right? We're in October. It's near Halloween. And so you watched Ghostbusters 1, 2, 3, I think there was. And then you watched as the Ghostbusters were women. And then you watched as the Ghostbusters had a new one. You've seen this with Ocean's Eleven back in the day. That's back in the 60s and 70s, there was one back then. And then you had Ocean's Eleven, 12, 13, and then I think we reverted to some other numbers. These are fresh updates, fresh eyes. We get some great movies, great pop culture with this. Amen? All right, there's been some good stuff. And here's the thing. This isn't just out, out in the world. It's also in the church. You see, even this morning, as, as my family and I, we were driving to church, um, we had some worship music on. My son had said, hey, can we listen to this? And we turned it on. And as I was listening, I began to realize we were singing about the blood of Jesus, but we were not singing an old hymn. We were singing something now. And yet I noticed that the notes in the song 
were actually an old hymn. You remember that? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But they never said those words specifically. They updated it. It was fresh eyes. And some of the other things that we see in postmodernism that are good are we see things like an openness to community, a longing for community even, an openness to spiritual conversations. Maybe you've not heard that, but there's an openness but it's an openness that's one-on-one. It's conversational, okay? As opposed to being told one way, it is conversational, okay? But there's another thing that postmodernism does. It's, it's actually in architecture. Postmodern architecture, it looks something like this. Now, you see something like this and you're like, I got to take a picture of that. My wife and I, a couple years back, we went to, to, or a year ago, we went to New York City. And when we went, there were some skyscrapers that were like, whoa, I've never seen anything like that. I've got to take a picture. And it is a fresh rendition of an old idea, okay? Now, when this comes into uh, the world and we talk about these things, I think it's also important to understand where some of this stems from. Because when you go to postmodernism, first you've got to talk about modernism, Okay, now when you think of modernism, think the industrial age. Think things like Ford's assembly line. You know, he came up with this this idea that, you know, you could make this assembly line and you put this part, then this part, this part, and eventually every few seconds you have a car coming off the line. And this worked its way into other places in society. It was very logical. It was very scientific. It was grounded. And there was a sense of this is going to save us. And then postmodernism came because there was some disillusionment from that. And ultimately, postmodernism is best characterized as the information age. Where do you get the most information in this age? Well, it's probably in your back pocket right now, right? It's computers. There's so much information to get. It's a matter of not not enough information, but too much information sometimes. And it's multiplied its effect with the internet. With the advent of the internet growing, you have so much information come, so many ideas. And so as we talk about postmodernism, it's important to understand what is the worldview of postmodernism as we're talking about this Worlds Apart series. So the postmodernist view believes, first and foremost, that there is no one overarching story. There is no one story that just arcs over all of time and all of people. Instead, it's, there's your truth and there's my truth and there's, there's different truths, okay? The second uh, uh, view of the postmodernist is there is no absolute truth. There is no absolute truth. You can't actually know truth. The third view is truth is determined primarily by observation and experience. Another way of thinking about this is how do I feel? What is my experience? What have I seen? It doesn't matter what, what, what the truth is out there. What is my truth? What have I seen? What have I experienced? And so the last few weeks as Pastor Matt has talked about worldviews, He's talked about how worldviews determine what we believe about certain things. And so, what is the view within postmodernism of God, reality, knowledge, human origins, ethics, afterlife? Now, we just talked about what the postmodernist view is. And so, when we talk about these, it's a bit of a trick question. We can't know. You may have a truth, I may have a truth, we may have a... There's different truths along the way, and the postmodernists would say, yeah, you can't really know it. And so, I want to talk about three specific lies of postmodern thought, because there's a lot of different lies, there's, there's a lot of good things, there's a lot of harmful, harmful things along the way, but I want to talk about three particular lies that I think it really boils things down to understanding some of the, the toxicity, some of the problems within postmodernism, okay? The first one, is, the first lie is perception determines reality. You've heard this before, haven't you? Say, well, you know, perception is reality, and I understand that. But when living that out, let's think about that, okay? Imagine that we went to a magic show. Wow! The magician, he... He, he cut her right in half. Did you see that? It was amazing. 
He's, it's magical. No, we understand that it's illusions, don't we? But here's the thing. If you take this to its end conclusion, they're asking that you actually believe that. For example, now, I woke up the other day, and when I woke up, I said, man, I feel like I'm 200 years old. And for my kids, they say, and you look 200 years old, okay? You, you know that feeling. It's just when you roll out of bed. But here's the truth. If I say, you know what, uh, I, I've got, I, I, you know, it's my, it's, it's my unbirthday today, and I am 200 years old. You'd say, no, you're not 200 years old. No, I really am. I'm 200 years old. I think that you should treat me with the respect of a 200-year-old man. 200-year-old human being, I know it all. I know these things. And you'd say, somehow or another, you have become detached from reality. Well, per perception's reality. That's my reality. Well, it's a lie. The second lie is all truth claims are power plays. Now, it's interesting within this, because if all truth claims are, are power statements or power plays, then by definition, so is that statement. If it implodes on itself again. The third lie, and this is one that's very important to understand, truth is subjective. The postmodernist view says that truth is subjective. And so there is no thing, there's nothing known as absolute truth. There is no absolute truth. And to that, I want to ask, are you absolutely certain of that? Because that in and of itself is a truth statement. To say that there's no such thing as absolute truth is to say there is absolutely no truth, and when you can't know it, and yet you are making a truth statement in the midst of that. Now, when we talk about this, I want to think about how does this live out in everyday life? Let's just take it for a ride. Let's just take it for a ride. When you think about there being no absolute truth, imagine this, this morning you were driving to church and, you know, I, I, I don't know if you believe in Jesus or you don't, but you know what? We're glad that you're here. But here's the thing. You were driving this morning and you were listening to music. You were listening to worship music and you were getting into it and everything. And you're like, praise the Lord. Thank you. Everything. And you're just, you're singing at the top of your lungs. You know, I know you guys do it. Okay. It's not just me, right? It's not just me. Every once in a while, you know, you see that person who you don't know what they're singing but because the, the window's down, but they're over there going at it, and you're like, yeah, go. But here's the thing. As you were singing and getting into that music, getting your groove on, your right foot started to get a little lead in it, and you started going faster and faster and faster. And you were, after a while, going 20, 25 miles an hour over, and you did not notice until suddenly you started seeing some sirens go by, okay? And you slowed down and the officer came up and the officer said, do you know how fast you are going? Oh, I was going the speed limit. I'm sorry, you were going 25 miles over the speed limit. No, 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 I'm sorry, officer. Nope, 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 nope. That's your truth. My truth is, I was going the speed limit. And in that moment, the police officer takes a piece of paper and says, well, good luck with your truth. Here's my truth. <laughs> Think about the everyday experience that you have. Imagine that you get poison ivy. And you're just itching all over the place. You know how that goes? It's just, you're just, oh my goodness, I'm dying here. And you go to the doctor and, doctor, you got to do something for me. And the doctor says, all right, here, I'm going to give you some ointment and these steroids. I need you to take this. And here's the thing. You're going to start out with six, then five, four, three, two, one. You've got to do this consistently. Otherwise, you're going to continue to have this problem. And you go home and you say, truth is subjective. One should be certainly enough. And you take it and you continue to itch because reality Perception is not just reality. Reality is reality, right? Or you say, you know what? I've got a bad headache. It says take two every four to six hours. However, I know what's best for me. I know my truth. And so 20 of these should be good. We should be done that much faster. 
And here's the thing, guys, the only thing better than power is more power, right? So sometimes you feel like that medication, whatever it is, you're like, I'm just going to take a little bit more. I'm going to take twice as much. And here's the thing, don't do that. Follow the directions because truth is not subjective and they actually know what they're talking about. This is what it looks like when we live out these things to their nth degree. So when we talk about these things, it goes even further though. In our, in our world, we have seen post, the postmodern view of truth being subjective, living out more and more every single day. We've seen it in things like the separation of gender and sexuality. Now for for millenniums, for thousands of years, we've understood that these two things are connected and the same. But then one day in the last five, ten years, and don't remember, it originated in the university in academia a long time ago, and they were talking about these things, but it entered into society only in recent times. And it began to be, we would have to ask questions like, what is a woman? What is a man? What is a cat? What is a tree? And the answer that some would say or have us believe is, well, only a woman can tell you that. Only a tree can tell you that. Only a man can tell you that. Truth is subjective. And so it doesn't matter what you were born with, how you were born, or anything like that. If you decide that you are a cat, you are a cat. If you decide that you're a tree, you're a tree. If you are a man and decide that you're a woman, now you're a woman. But the fact and the truth of the matter is, is that truth is not subjective. And these things, they've entered into culture, they've entered into society, and and oftentimes we're not quite certain how to walk in this. It's very difficult sometimes. And some of the difficulty we have to just name, some of the difficulty is there are different views. We have the modernist view and the postmodernist view. Today, there are probably more uh, generations than most. You have the silent generation still living. You have the baby boomer generation. You have Gen X. You have that little piece, Xenials. You've got generation Y, Z. Now you've got Alpha. And each one of these has a little bit different view of the world, all interacting all along the way. And some of you have lived long enough to go, wow, things look so much different than when I was growing up. And you've got these others who are saying, what are you talking about? It's always been like this. Nothing's changed. Give it some time. You'll live a little longer. But what does God's word say about all this? You know, when we talk about things like right and wrong, where does the meaning of life come from? Is there meaning in life? These things matter. And God's word has a lot to say about it. And before you think that somehow or another, man, things have never been this bad before. Hold that thought. Because God's word, God's word has something to say about that as well. You see, when you go back to the book of Judges, Early on in the scriptures, you see these words in Judges 17, 6. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Or maybe your translation says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Doesn't sound too disconnected from many today. Or I like how Paul, an early follower of Jesus, We're going to hear from Paul quite a bit this morning. Paul says in Romans 8, 5, he says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Now, the hope is that if you are a follower of Jesus, not even hope, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Spirit indwelling in you, living in you. And so you have a choice Set your heart on the things that the Spirit desires or on what the flesh desires. And when we set our heart on what the flesh desires, it begins to sound something like this. Maybe you've heard this before where someone has been married for many years and they decide, you know what, sweetheart, I've decided to go over here and they're cheating on their spouse. And at some point or another, they might say this word, well, the heart wants what the heart wants. 
The heart wants what the heart wants. And yes, it is a lie. It's one of those things where, listen, no, that's what the flesh desires, okay? Do not be deceived, my brothers. A man reaps what he sows. Those who, who sow according to the flesh will reap that reward, but those who who sow to the Spirit will reap that reward. And you have to make a decision between these two. They are two diametrically opposed worldviews. One says there's no truth. The other one says, no, 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 no. There's truth to be known. And we're going to learn more about that here in a moment. Remember, Jeremiah reminds us also that the heart above all else, it's evil. You can't, it's deceitful. You can't trust it. Think about Monday morning when you wake up oftentimes and you're like, oh, today is going to be horrible. And then it ends up being great. Or today is going to be great. And then, you know, reality doesn't need to be based simply on emotions. It's not to deny them, but it's also to acknowledge them. And then we can acknowledge the Lord with them and not walk alone. But I think that there's a great deal of wisdom from the Proverbs. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart. Everything you do flows from it. It matters what you are thinking on. What you think on, what you, what you dwell on matters. Guard your heart. Proverbs 21.2 says, A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. You see, motivations actually matter. It doesn't matter what argument you're having in your head. You know, we've all had that moment where we justify what we are doing or what we are not doing. And we're like, well, I'm justified in that. Well, the Lord will look at that pride. He'll look at arrogance. He'll look at all these things. He will weigh the heart. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Just because we feel something, just because we perceive something, does not make it truth. And ultimately in this life, what we build on matters. What we build on matters. You see, Jesus, He was speaking to the church. He was actually speaking to to believers at at that time. And, And He spoke to people who were kind of trying to decide and such, and as he spoke, he, he spoke a parable. And as he spoke the parable, he said, you know, there was a, a man and he built, he built a house on a rock. And those who, who build their home on the rock, on my teachings, you know, when the waves of life, when the storms come, will not be blown away. But those who build on the sand, they're not putting my teachings into effect they're going to be blown away. And let me tell you, the storms, it's not will they come, it's when they come. And so, you know, you may be a follower of Jesus, but Paul speaks to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians three twelve and 13, he's speaking to believers. And he says, if anyone builds on this foundation, that is Jesus Christ, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw... Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to life. Foundations matter, but in time, everything built on that foundation is also tested. And the Lord will weigh what the motives were. He will weigh what was built upon that. And we don't get to say, yeah, I don't agree with you, God. I think you're wrong about that. I think that, no, 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 that wasn't straw. That wasn't stuff. No, 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 that was... There's something about God. He is the truth. He knows truth. He made truth. And in the midst of this, I think it's important for us to really understand how important foundations are. Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? What can the, founda- what can the righteous do? I think about that postmodern architecture. You know what's interesting about that? It looks so strange, didn't it? It looks so different. And it's, it's, it's kind of mesmerizing, isn't it? But there's something that's really interesting with postmodern architecture. You know what doesn't change? The foundation. 
The foundation is always having to be set. It might look slightly different, but here's the thing. The math is is not different. Math doesn't change. If it's not built correctly, it will crumble to the ground. The foundations absolutely matter. And how does this translate into life? I remember back in high school, back in the day, back in the 90s, I remember being in a science class, a biology class, and I remember having to learn about the theory of evolution, the theory of evolution. But today, many years later, when I watch programming, when I watch the news, when I watch science, I don't hear about the theory of evolution. I hear it purported as if evolution is law. It's unchanging. This is the view, and it's the only view. Oh, everybody agrees with this. All scientists agree with this. No, they don't. It's one theory amongst others. And this theory, when lived out, when lived out, tells us, tells our children, there's no meaning in life. There is no search for significance. At one time, there was nothing And then there was pond scum, that's your ancestors, pond scum, not current, past. I know some of us are like, oh, if you met my in-laws, okay, you should be nice. Christmas is coming, so are gifts. But, But here's the thing. It's not just, hey, you came from apes. No, 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 keep on going back. Ultimately, it's kind of interesting because if you really think about that worldview, every time that you have a stake, that is a form of cannibalism. I know, take it to its nth degree. And let me tell you, I love steak. I'm having brisket later today, and it is not cannibalism. Thank you, Lord. But here's the thing, it really does matter. And I think back to my kids. This is just, my daughter's getting ready to graduate college, but I remember just a few years back in eighth grade. She came home from the public school, and as she came home, I recall how she brought a project home. She was learning a little about Islam, and I went, well... It's probably, she's just getting a history lesson. They're just learning a little. And then about a month later, she came and she had this project that she was doing on Hinduism and reincarnation. I went, whoa, hold on, stop the press. What is going on here? My kid is at an age where she's trying to determine what is my worldview? What do I believe about that? Guess what? That's my responsibility, not the public schools. And in the midst of it, I realized, at first I got, I got upset. I was like, you're teaching all these different religions and everything else. And then I realized, no, 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 no. There's more to it than that. They're teaching, yes, a worldview, but it's secular humanism. And it is rooted in postmodern philosophy. She was learning, this friend's Hindu, and this one's Muslim, and, and this one's atheistic, and this one's agnostic, and, and oh, there's this and that. And guess what? Guess what, kids? All these views are equally true, and it's a beautiful, wonderful thing, isn't it? No, it's a lie, because there is truth to be known. There is truth to be known. In fact, in fact, we're going to get to it in just a moment, but I want to ask a question, because we're going to get to the truth. But first, within that truth, how do we even discern truth? How do we discern? How do we know what's truth and what's a lie and what is the anchor that we can have for our souls? And I think that we find the answer to this in Jeremiah 6, 16. God speaks to Israel. It says, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. You see, this was something that in the past was offered to Israel, and Israel rejected it. We have the option to walk in the ancient paths of God's Word, the ancient truths of God's Word that are just as valid as today as the moment that they were spoken, the moment that they were written, the moment that they were passed on from generation to generation to generation. You see, in God's word, it doesn't matter if you're an alpha 
or a silent generation or someplace in between. The truth of God's word remains for all generations and its ancient paths are always true and they will also and always offer a place for the soul to rest. In fact, Jesus says it this way. He makes it really clear. If you want to know what truth is, he says this in in John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Sounds a little exclusive, doesn't it? So when the kids are in school and they're being told, hey, they're all equally valid, Jesus himself says, actually, no, they're not. There is no way to the Father except through me. I am the way, Jesus says. He says elsewhere in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn truth. Learn the truth. There is absolute truth. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And understand when, it says, when he says, take your yoke upon me, There's a, this is a rabbinic idea. The idea that you are going to take my worldview on you, my lens through which I look at everything, my teachings, you're going to take them upon you. And this is how you are going to interpret the things that you're going to experience in life. You're going to build upon this rock as you live this out and put it into practice. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I think the best way that we can actually put that into practice every single day is found in Psalm 119, 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. As I hide, as we hide God's word in our heart, we learn how to walk with God. Not in a truth, but in the truth. And it is an anchor for our soul. You know, it's interesting because postmodernism has the power to help us to reimagine the church. But the question is is it going to be made in our image or in his image? And it's important to understand, you know. As we come to this what now God moment, it's important to understand that sin has to be defined. You see, when Jesus came to die for the world, unfortunately, he didn't die for your bad feelings, for people who treated you poorly. He came to die for your sins. We have to actually own it. And here's the thing. When we, when we come to believe that Jesus died for our sins, we have to be able to also understand that Jesus died for their sins as well. And we have to actually be able to recognize what it is. Because if we came to the cross for our sins, the only place where we're ever going to find forgiveness for anyone else is again at the cross. So when we come to this what now, God, There's two things I want you to consider, two things specifically. The first one is the way that we grow in the truth, the way that we walk in this culture matters. The first thing that's important to do is to study God's word daily. Be refreshed by his word. Start with what is God trying to say, not how do I feel about it. It's important to understand that we need to start with observation. What is God calling me to do, to stop, to continue to do? What is God actually saying in his word first and foremost? And then we can get to the application as opposed to starting out with, well, how does this make me feel? We're not the center of the universe. The second thing is talk to your kids about the scriptures and make certain they they don't understand it simply as your truth, but as the truth. You see, many people today, unbeknownst to us, are raising our kids, and we're, raising, they're, we're letting the public school also teach them. Society teach them a worldview, and they have a whole lot more time oftentimes. We're not taking the time, but when we do take the time to pour into our kids... Our kids eventually leave the house and the entire time they've been understanding, well, that was your worldview, mom and dad. That was your worldview, but this is my worldview because that's what they've been taught. So be consistent. Talk to them about 
the way, the truth, and the life and help them to understand that there is absolute truth. And here's the thing. If we don't speak the truth boldly here in the church, in our families, in our marriages, how will we live it boldly out there? Let's pray. Father, we come to you thanking you for the truth of your word and asking that you would plant it in our hearts and let it grow and help us, help us to live consistently from generation to generation in the truth and the life that you offer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.